So first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this honor in the 21st uh, Medical and Health Research Week. And with this opportunity, I would like to share with all of you, everyone in this uh, hall, the exciting field of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. I will relate, I will relate uh, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine to the theme of this conference, which is enhancing translational research for healthcare empowerment. What is actually translational research or translational science? It's actually basic science discoveries discoveries in the laboratory that are later being used for patients in the wards. They, they have to go through in vitro study, then in vivo study, means study in small animal, then later in big animal models, and then being used in patients. And uh, conversely, cl clinical observation, which are uh, generated from patients, will give back uh, important data for basic science research. It's actually a circle, not only from bench to bedside, but data from the bed can be used. Whatever the patient doesn't have, no treatment or inadequate treatment or uh, side effects of treatment can be more investigated more and bring back to the bench. So this is actually translational medicine and it encompasses of so many disciplines. I'll be talking about tissue engineering. It is actually a field to generate, to repair or to replace either cells, tissues or organs. So the main components of tissue engineering is actually the cells, the growth factors or the bioactive components and scaffolds. So the process is actually simple. Taking a part of your body, the tissue that you want to make, let's say we want to make a piece of skin, a large piece of skin. So a small piece of, a piece of skin is being harvested from the patient. Being the cell from the uh, skin will be liberated, cultured in the laboratory to make an increase, to produce in, uh, enough number of cells. They, by the help of growth factors or other uh, cytokines and this will be then be embedded into a scaffold. A scaffold is a 3D material that can hold the cells and they will then uh, uh, I mean uh, put for a while to be stabilized, to grow and then the skin or whatever tissue that, is, that you want to produce is then put back into the individual. We, tissue engineers, prefer autologicity. Autologous means from you back to you because we do not want to deal with the problem of rejection. And we hope to find cure rather than to treat symptoms. What I mean is, in case of a diabetic patient, at the moment, we are just treating the symptom of the diabetic patient, which is just lower, lowering the blood glucose. What if we can actually take some, a, a cell from the patient, a stem cell, uh, uh, a stem cell from the patient, turn it into pancreatic cell, and then put the pancreas back to the patient, and voila, you, you will solve the problem of the patient. You will cure the patient of his disease, not just treating symptom like what we're doing now. And the other term that you will hear is regenerative medicine. It's actually a part of tissue engineering. And uh, people use regenerative medicine when they use stem cell to produce the tissue. So we are actually making body parts for future, for future uh, but, uh, when, when your body tissues are damaged. I'll go in detail in the production of our tissue engineered skin, which is our first prototype in hospital UKM. So how, do, how did we do it? So we took a small piece of skin from patient. We have, the skin has two layers. We digest the skin into the epidermis and the dermis. There are two cell types. So the cell types are being cultured separately, the fibroblast and also the keratinocyte. They are being cultured separately 
So they grow separately because they re they require different uh, different requirements. So we grow the cell, get the cell to the number that we want, then we remake the skin layer by layer because it's so uh, it's such a soft structure. We have to use a medical grade seal at the bottom of the dish, the petri dish. Then we layer the outside layer of the skin, which is the keratinocyte, with the scaffold, which is the fibrin matrix. And on top of the keratinocyte, there will be the fibroblast, which is the inside layer of the skin. So, the product consists of three layers. Outside is the, the, the most down, down, down layer is the silk, then the epidermis, and the dermis. And this is our product. And... And when we want to use it on patient, we actually flip it over and the silk will be on top. And when the patient takes up the skin, we can actually peel the silk off. Okay, this looks so simple, but it took us seven years to optimize all this. And when we have made the skin, people would ask us, how do you know your skin is actually skin? You're not culturing or making something else. So we look at the structure. We scientists, we look at structure, the morphology, so it, it is by layer. We have scientists from pathology to have a look at our slides. They are by layer. Then we implant this skin at the back of a mice. We use nude mice, which is a special mice, uh, a mice which does not have a thymus, which will, which will not reject this human skin. This is actually human skin, so we implant it and to our surprise, the skin took very well and there was no scarring around it. It was taking so well, although the, our skin has no color, but later the, all the pigments around the normal skin migrated and the skin becomes almost as normal as the surrounding skin. We then harvest this skin and uh, look at um, the histology. And look at the histology. And it is, and it is, and it resembles the normal human skin. Also, it has the properties of all the proteins that's present in a normal skin. And we published this paper in a very in a flagship journal for wound research, which is Burns. We then uh, collaborate with our counterpart in UPM, the electron microscopy expert, and showed. This, uh, the, the group, uh, our engineered skin, because yes, in the normal histology, it resembles skin, but is in the electron microscopy, is it like normal skin? And we are very delighted to see all this collagen fibril, the microfibril between the epidermis and the dermis res, as, resemble exactly the normal skin, and it also uh, rep, uh, I mean, has the uh, genes of normal skin. We also got this published in an electron microscopy journal. And then we were using a fetal bovine serum, an animal serum to grow our cell. But we are thinking of translating this product. So we need to culture it in human serum. So another PhD student, uh, another master student took two years to work on fetal bovine serum versus human serum. And we found that the human serum actually made the skin cell proliferate faster and better than the fetal bovine serum, which is a standard supplement for any cell culture. And when we grow cells fast, people would ask us, are you making cancer cells? You're forcing the cells to grow. And we did our cell cycle analysis and they resemble normal cells. And we look, look at the genes that are being expressed in these cells that's being cultured in human serum. And we are so delighted. They, in, they actually upregulated the collagen type 3 genes and the fibronectin genes, which are genes that's important in wound healing. And they downregulate the alpha smooth muscle acting gene, which is the gene that causes scarring. So we are so happy with this result and we got it published in our Archives of Medical Research. And we use, remember, we had to use enzymes to digest the cell. And the standard enzyme is of porcine origin. But if we are, we are going to translate this product, we want to have options for our patients. So we worked another 
master student worked on optimizing triple select, which is a recombinant enzyme. So we found out after two years that the cells can be digest and the cells uh, viability, activity and the gene expression are still very good even though we use a recombinant uh, enzyme. And we have showed that the, all the proteins are still present even though we are culturing it using recombinant enzymes. And we got it published in Cells and Tissue Bank. And then we were asking us ourselves, uh, will our tissue be alive? How long? How long can we keep our tissue in genetic skin if we want to transfer it to patients somewhere outside Malaysia? So we went uh, further to analyze the shell life of our product. We went to the maximum of 72 hours. We store our product in a uh, culture media at 4 degrees Celsius. And we are very happy to see that even after 72 hours, the product is intact, the cells are still alive. And when we digest the engineered skin, they actually have a live cell, still have the keratinocytes and the fibroblasts alive. And we can keep this bilayered skin until 72 hours of duration. And you have been traveled all over the world and you know that by 22, uh, 72 hours, you can reach any part of the world. So if this product makes it to the world, we can deliver to any part of the world. So we got it published in uh, the primary result in Science Malaysia now. Then we got it the main result in PLOS One. And according to PLOS One, this is the first time they are actually receiving papers on shell life of engineered tissue. Uh, and to apply for ethics approval, we have to proceed to do animal trial. We do not want actually to do any more trial because we think we have made the engineered skin a human skin, but at the ethics needs an animal model. So we went to do an animal model project. If this is another master student, and we, we found that the bilayered skin, we, ha we have non chambered wound and chambered wound to see regenerative capability. It shows that the bilayered skin, this is bilayered skin, single layer, single layer. The bilayered skin and the single layer skin are all, uh, uh, they can actually uh, promote wound healing, both, even in single layer. But the histology showed that the bilayer is much better. And we've got this published in uh, uh, advanced uh, skin wound care and also in biomedical research. And ladies and gentlemen, this is our first prototype, which we named Kuletku initially. Kuletku means it's from you, back to you. It's yours. So, and then we want to translate this. We need to do proper clinical trial. And to proceed with clinical trial, we need to have a proper laboratory. So we, we, we started to write proposals to get money, funding for clinical trial. But along the way, that, there was a case, a very bad burn case that was being transferred to our hospital. This was the breakthrough. This girl, a four-year-old girl, she was wearing this kind of dress, a very fancy dress, and she wanted to cross a group of boys who are playing with fires, with candles and so. So she, at her, her gown actually caught fire, and she was on fire, and she was admitted with 55% burns to Hospital Sutana Amina in Johor. She, SSG was done on her, as usual, that's the only available technique to treat skin loss. So many episodes of SSG was done to her until there was no more skin to be taken from her and she was in very bad condition. She had infection, she had septicemia and she was ventilated in Sutanah Amina Johor, in hospital in Johor. The parents was uh, permission for, uh, from the parents. They had to take permission from the parents to harvest skin from the scalp of this child in Johor. The parents refused. The parents said, if it's time for, for my child to go, just let her go. I do not want tissues from the scalp to be taken from her. She was then transferred to our burns unit in HUKM and was taken care by our plastic surgeon at that point of time. She was there. We saw the patient. She was ill. The plastic surgeon knew about our 
research, we had the prototype ready, we asked permission from the parents and we got special permission from the hospital for compassionate use. We cultured, we made six pieces of tissue Indian skin for this child. At that, when, when, when she came here, there was 34% uh, from 55 to 30. They have treated part of it. And um, we made six pieces of tissue engineered skin in the first round. And we had another second round for her. This was the patient at the day of implantation. This was part of the body. Right leg. You can see the engineered skin. The, the kulekku. We had so many. Alhamdulillah, two and a half months later after implantation, the, the wound healed. And even the nurses in the burns unit were so surprised of her wellness, how she recovered. She recovered so well with engineered skin, not like patients who had received the normal split skin grafting. And the other thing that we are so happy and the surgeons are so happy, there are no contractures at the knee joint, at the joints. If you had used split skin grafting or healing by itself, they would definitely have contractures. But there were none. We are so happy. This child, this little girl, walked to our laboratory. We celebrated her fifth birthday together in the lab. It was a moment for all of us because we, from the lab, we, we are able to see the product of our research being used on patients and save, has saved the life of this patient. This is just part of her, her body. And whoever was there, I think would have felt it together with me. And with this case, we work harder, harder to get money, to build this lab that Angela was telling you all about, a certified good manufacturing lab. It costs us 10 million ringgit. Maybe for some of you who are businessmen, it's not a lot of money, but for us as a lecturer, it is so much, so expensive. But Alhamdulillah, with that case as our forefront um, objective, we want to proceed with proper clinical trial and get this product to the world. You all are so welcome to visit the lab, which is now under Professor Angela at on the 12th floor of the clinical block. Why GMP? Why this expensive lab? No, why not just culture in just the normal laboratory? Because we have to produce a consistent product. We have to have traceability <coughs> throughout all the processes because the product has to emphasize on quality, safety, and also efficacy. And we have completed our first and second phase clinical trial on 14 patients being funded, oh yeah, the 10 million, 7 million was from U MTDC and UKM gave us the, the, tech, the 3 million. So, we have done cases on burns, trauma and diabetic ulcer to evaluate the safety and efficacy. We published some of it in, uh, uh, this is with the orthopedic team uh, and then we've also published another case with open fracture. We are writing up the full paper at the moment. And ladies, of gen ladies and gentlemen, small piece of skin into a big piece of skin. We later named the, our product MyDerm because when we pitch for more funding, the authority, the industry say this is re very, Kuleku means very in national. So you want to go international, you cannot use a Malay word. <laughs> All right. So we brainstorm and brainstorm. We wanted it to be my skin, but another company has taken up my skin. A collagen product. Then we, we thought, my derm, why not? And we, we uh, uh, look for, further, and my derm was not taken up yet. So my still means me, still means cool. And my also represents Malaysia if this product goes out to the world. And this product has won, we have, we have Malaysian patent granted, we have many, many awards. And uh, actually, I presented this product in Geneva with, with Dr. Wahab when we were there a long, long time ago, probably in 2004. Yeah. And then this product is now being licensed to a company called Cell Tissue Technologies and Jan Berhad, which is a startup UKM company and now has been spin off. The, the, the product now is with the company until UKM takes back the license. So this is the story of translational research. 
it's a very busy slide, but bear with me. We started research in year 2000, optimized cell culture, in vitro, in vivo, small animal, big animal, proof of concept in the child. We patent the product, we have more R&D with animal-based supplements. And when we started the research, there was no requirement by Ministry of Health. But later along the way, there were requirements to build a GMP lab. So we went to find funding, it took us four years to climb up and stairs, to cry here and there, to get the funding. And finally, GMP lab was initiated in 2009. Meanwhile, we went to train human resource in Australia, in Melbourne, and we had the lab completed in 2011, got it accredited in, a, in, uh, in year, July 2012, a very emotional moment for all of us again. This was in Ramadan. It was really hard work to, to build the lab and to get it accredited to the level of Kementerian Kesehatan Malaysia. And at that moment of time, we here in UKM have the highest, more, the topmost level of regulate, regulated laboratories. We then had our proper clinical trial done, completed 2015, and now Malaysia has its own guideline called CGTP. It has been published in 2016 and it will be that implemented in 2021. And in 2021, all research has to be done in GMP lab. So my derm trial has been completed, but we have drawbacks. Yes, we do have drawbacks. We have patients that has to be reversed back to split skin grafting. We have, page, we have uh, we have learned a lot from our clinical trial and we are taking the result back to basic science. And what we've learned, cells need time to grow and the growing of cells varies from patient to patient. And GMP grade chemicals are so, so, so very expensive and the product is very expensive. At the moment, Kulit Co is being sold at 30,000 ringgit per piece. So we are, we are doing more research now. We are looking at PRP. We are not culturing cells now. We are looking at digested cells only. We are looking at factors that are being secreted by skin cells. Can this help? Can this help healing? We are looking at bioactive scaffolds, scaffolds that promote healing. So we are working towards this. Remember when I said translational research is on not only one side, it's also the other side, getting results from patients and going back to the laboratory. So we then work on digesting cells. We just digest the skin and, and there are enough number of cells. We mix the cell with, with platelet-rich plasma. So we have published this result. They can actually work too. We are now looking for funding to proceed with a clinical trial. This are also, the animal model has been completed. We are also looking at collagen as a bioactive uh, Scaffold, we put collagen, we use ovine collagen with skin cells. They are also good dressing material as well as skin substitute. We got this published in a Q1 journal and another Q1 journal. This is our flagship journal. Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine is the flagship journal in this area. And we also looked at uh, protein that's been secreted by the skin cells. We're not using skin cells now. We have factors that are being secreted by skin cells and these factors are then embedded into the uh, scaffold, which is the collagen. And we have used this in the animal model and they actually worked for wound healing. And we've got this published in uh, cytotechnology. We analyze, uh, we do proteomic analysis. We work, we work with Unicity Malaya. And then we have, we have actually completed the study on safety and efficacy of this secretion, of the secretomes and use it as a cellular 3D skin patch. Besides skin, we have many, many, many other organs that's been growing in our secret laboratory on the third, 12th floor. <laughs> so another product that is already ready for clinical trial, actively discussing with the industry partner, is the cartilage engineering. We have an innovative cell stem cell therapy that can be injected into the knee joint to heal, to heal osteoarthritis, to heal, not to stop the progression, to heal and reverse osteoarthritis. So we have published this result. We also we done we did the same thing, autologous serum, 
then we do the um, model. So we, we have, to get ethics approval, we have to create an animal model of osteoarthritis. We had to take out the anterior cruciate ligament and the meniscus of the knee joint of the sheep to make the sheep osteoarthritis. <coughs> then we injected the stem cell. So we had this published in experimental gerontology was a Q1 journal. Osteoarthritis and cartilage is also a Q1 journal. And we got the shell life evaluation, like in the skin. We also had a shell life evaluation and it's in scientific report. And ladies and gentlemen, this is our next product. Next product. Yeah, we name it Lutoko. We, um, we are in the process. At the moment, Tan Sri Wahid seems to like, uh, Tan Sri Wahid, the chairman of uh, UKM, seems to like the name. Until someone tells us to change, to I don't know, we are going to keep to Lutoko, which is an innovative stem cell therapy. And we have mapped it to, uh, sorry, we have ma mapped the product to all the products in the world. You can see that it's at, an, at a section where it's out superior, superior to other products in the world. We are discussing very closely with the company to initiate the first phase clinical trial. We hope that the Wahab can help us further. We have trachea for the, from the ENT group. We engineered trachea. So we publish engineered trachea using uh, highline cartilage. Then we use it in sheep model, Dr. Haikal's work. Then we use human serum. We got it in tissue and cell. And then the best source of respiratory epithelium that can be used to make trachea epithelium is from the turbinate that you all throw away, dear EMT surgeon. And we went to, uh, to, to investigate on the scaffold and we started work on electron spinning and we found that uh, the respiratory epithelium from the turbinates actually grew very well on the PMMA fibers. And bone tissue injury, this is Angela's uh, PhD thesis. We found the best source actually from the periosteum, but we couldn't get periosteum to work with, so we resorted to bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell. And then we use biomaterial. Invest this is actually a five year work. I'm just flipping through everything TCPHA. And then we uh, went deeper into how many cells are we going to sit into the scaffold. And uh, finally, we got it done on a rabbit model. And uh, actually, for the bone tissue, Angela, Prof. Angela and Prof. Yazid has actually used it in two individuals, and it's also going for further clinical trial if we get the funding. So I hope the authority can help us out. And we also work in cornea, on cornea. This is Dr. Nozana's work, uh, probably a long, long time ago when she was younger. <laughs> so we worked on cornea. We have successfully engineered cornea and tested it on a rabbit model. So we have published it uh, in, uh, can I remember this journal? And then... We use bone marrow. Besides using uh, limbal stem cell, we also use other sources of stem cell to make cornea because it's not easy to get limbal stem cell. So we went to use bone marrow. Then we also work on retina and we got it published in a Q1 journal. And we also look at how can we use water and jelly mesenchymal stem cell, which is a gift every time a child is born. There will be this huge umbilical cord with placenta, with plenty of uh, stem cells. So we, we, we have tested the safety and efficacy of the human water and jelly stem cells for retinal de degeneration, de degeneration and looking at treating macular degenerative diseases. And nerve tissue engineering is uh, three PhD students. So we've published in uh, good journals on how we uh, found induction factors to turn stem cell into nerve cell. In skin, for skin, you can take the skin and culture the skin. But for nerve, you cannot take the nerve. Because if you take up the nerve, even a small piece, your patient will be paralyzed. So we have to look at other sources to make nerve. So we look at the sarcoma stem cell. And then we, we, we use uh, PLGA. And then uh, we use and, uh, the bone marrow. We look at bone marrow 
And finally, uh, this is with uh, the orthopedic team, we look at efficacy of the cell-feeded muscle stuff vein conduit because the, the, the orthopedic surgeon loves this muscle stuff vein. So we use muscle stuff vein in our rash uh, shytic nerve repair and actually the rash shows some improvement. And uh, we also work on cardiomyocytes with our cardiothoracic surgeons and cardiologists. And uh, we want to induce bone marrow stem cells into active, healthy cardiomyocytes. And we have successfully done it. And uh, we have induced and we have also looked at how this induced cardiomyocyte can actually save the ischemic myocardium. So we have published this in cardiovascular engineering and we are writing another two papers in this. And ladies and gentlemen, barrier. There's a lot of barrier to translation, translational research. Yeah? You can see this. This deep, deep death valley. There's cultural differences between us, between basic scientists and clinicians. There's, there are, there is, there will always be. But we have to start communicating. We, ha we have to start educating ourselves, training towards translating our research. Although we have different goals. Some people do research to, get, to just get papers published for their promotion so that they can go out and work in the private sector. Some wants to do this because they love to do this, because they want to do this. And so many reasons. And then the other thing that's the big barrier is regulatory environment. We had to face through a lot of regulatory environment. When we started tissue engineering, there was not nobody nobody knows about cell therapy in Malaysia or tissue engineering. There was no guideline. Along the way, we were caught. But we we went to be friends with the authorities. And we are now very good friends of the authorities in Kementerian and Kesehatan Malaysia. There are also lack of resources in the workplace. We have, we have uh, uh, no time. That's what all this, the lecturers say. No time to do research. No time to write papers. So the dean has to do something about this. And then lack of role models. Lack of mentors. Because they are all leaving us. We should keep them. We should make them stay here. All our seniors, these professors, make them stay here. If not full time. Make them stay here one an hour a week until until they die. <laughs> yes, make them stay here. Make Datuk Khaled Kadir stay here with us at least one hour a week. We we need people like him. And lack of infrastructure, we strive with blood and tears to get our lab to get our lab. Right, right. So bench. The bedside is really complex. We need to have team collaboration, collaboration between academic, government, government-linked companies, and regulators. We all have to speak the common language. We all have to have common understanding about the meaning of the word translation. And now, a little bit on my new love. <coughs> Three and a half years ago, I started a group called Revelation-Based Medicine. This is made to make myself closer to Al Quran. We want to go to provide database, database on those uh, of foods of the Quran. We call us, we call our group FOQ group. We want to look at mechanism of action and signaling pathways of foods of the Quran and so many other things. So what what have we done in this new group, my new love? We have started to work on kalulut honey using the tools of regenerative medicine. We looked at how kalulut honey. Uh, can help in a repair, in wound repair. We went to look at uh, molecular basis. We had published this in uh, Wound Master. We had a review in Science Malaysia. Now. We published in, this is a Q1 journal, where we actually look at various types of stingless honey. And then now we are looking at epithelial mesenchymal transition in wound healing. We are going into the signaling pathway so that one day our Ustaz and Ustaza has scientific evidence to present, not just talking about honey and wound healing, but how honey causes wound healing. It actually modulates the epithelial to mesenchymal translation. Then we also are working very, uh, we, there's three PhD students working on olive and its bioactive component, which is hydroxytyrosol, on respiratory epithelial, on Schwann cells, and also on wound healing. 
We've also got results published in Q1 journal on TGF beta 1 induced EMT, which is wound healing, and we are now associating this this with chronic rhinosinusitis because in the old literature, all this is actually being used in chronic sinusitis. So we want to know why, why they are being used and they are not being used now in this modern era. It's mentioned. And we also recently got our review paper published also in the Q1 journal. And also we have one uh, PhD student working on neuroprotective agent, olive and neuroprotective agent, and we've got one review paper published in Frontiers. We are also working, at, working with uh, Ficus carica or buah fit, buah thin, on osteogenesis because there's a paper in Nature saying that when the birds fly to an area and when they saw there's uh, fig fruit and other fruits, they will only go to the fig fruit because fig fruit is the fruit we, we, which has the highest content of calcium, which is good for their wings. So we're looking at, and we've got it published, our review in Science Malaysia now, and also in uh, Stem Cell International. I love this word of wisdom by Louis Pasteur. To him, who devotes his life to science, nothing can give more happiness than increasing the number of discoveries. But his cup of joy is full when the results of his studies immediately find practical application. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, our goal is to turn knowledge into applications that benefit people and I won't be standing here today to deliver this talk without all my students, my undergraduate, my postgraduate from the Tissue Engineering Center, the clinical team, and my department, Department of Physiology. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening.